Hello, hello to all. I welcome you to this first in the summer series of collaborative services between the Unitarian Church of Edmonton, the Westwood Unitarians also here in Edmonton, Calgary Unitarians, Saskatoon Unitarians and the Kelowna Unitarians and whoever else might be joining us, who knows, over the summer. Whether you are participating from home, at your congregation's gathering place, or later on from some other online platform, you are indeed welcome here. For this service, all you need to bring is yourself, ready to receive whatever may bring you hope, or courage, or resilience, or a more compassionate heart. My name is the Reverend Rosemary Morrison, and I am the minister at the Unitarian Church of Edmonton. And we're situated here along the banks of the North Saskatchewan River on Treaty 6 territory. I would like to share Reverend Sean Neil Barron's treaty or land acknowledgement. As we begin to live into our eighth principle, let's take these words to heart. He writes, we gather together as a community of seekers to honor the interdependence of life, to respect the dignity of all, and to honor the land we walk humbly upon. Friends, let us acknowledge that we walk upon the traditional territories of the First Peoples of Canada, the original nations of this land, who continue to cry out for justice and self-determination. We are blessed with a space and opportunity to strive to live out our common principles, to bring justice, equity, and compassion into our daily lives, to resist all that threatens the earth and her people, and to live out our dream of a world community of peace, liberty, and justice for all. Let these thoughts carry us forth as we journey and worship together. So summer is upon us, a time of wishing we could be outside more if we're working inside or overwhelmed perhaps with the amount of extra work summer brings to us. Weeding, tending the garden, mowing, trimming, cleaning up for guests, cleaning up after they leave creating time for having picnics or camping trips and all that packing and cleaning that has to happen. We here on the Canadian Prairie know that this time is short and we need to make the most of these beautiful days. You know, in, in our church life, some congregations carry on, like in Canada they, and in the United States, they just carry on, every service continues. And some take a complete break. They shut the church down or the congregation down. And But you know what? All need our support. So please make sure your contributions to your congregation continue throughout the summer. As well, please find out if your congregation is sharing its abundance with an organization and use that organization's online donation feature to donate generously. Your gifts are held in trust. Your congregations are grateful for you. And of course, without your gifts, our congregations could not exist, for we are completely self-supporting. Thank you. And now let's begin to settle in and unwind and relax, and to help with that, I offer this beautiful piece of music presented to you by my friend uh, Richard Maddox. He has kindly agreed to share his gifts with all of us this summer. He is playing a piece by Fanny Mendelssohn. Enjoy.
our chalice lighting, I would like to share words by Reverend Teresa Soto. It's from her book, Spilling the Light, Meditations on Hope and Resilience. I know that you are hungry for justice, and sometimes when you fail, it feels like the times when you open the refrigerator door, look inside and close it, nothing having met your appetite. But there is always trying again. There is the fact that one just act is the beginning. And together we can build another. The gnawing hunger for a different future is one that we feed in the present. Your diligence, your tenacity, your willingness to learn, not just know, but also do. Hunger shaping how you nourish, feeding one another with the long spoons of your compassion until you're strong enough to feed the part of the world that you can reach. And now I light our chalice. Here we go. Our chalice is now lit. And our first opportunity to join in music is coming right up. So please join in with hymn number 188, Come, Come, Whoever You Are, a familiar and popular one to start a service with. Um, the words will be on the screen. Hum along, sing along, sing in rounds, just listen, whatever your heart desires. Enjoy. Come, come, whoever you are, wonder, worshiper, lover of living, ours is no caravan of despair. Come yet again, come, come. The Ant Farmers by Jamie Hinson Rieger, illustrated by Claudia Brooks. I don't know if you know this, but there are many different kinds of ants in the world who behave in all kinds of different ways. Some kinds of ants live by being farmers. Did you know there were ants who were farmers? Our story is about leafcutter ants. Leafcutter ants pull pieces of leaves off of a tree and then they carry their leaves to their home underground and chew them up and spread them out in special rooms where fungus grows on top. Then the ants harvest and eat the fungus. It's just like growing corn or lettuce, only these ants grow fungus. So, once upon a time, there was a colony of leafcutter ants who lived in the ground under a big shady tree in Texas. And the ants farmed by taking bits of the leaves off that tree down into their home underground to grow fungus. They didn't take all the leaves from the tree, or even most of the leaves, but always stopped after just a little. One day, one of the ants, who was a smart, ambitious young ant named Myrna, said, Why do we always take so few of the leaves from the tree? If we had more leaves to spread out, we could grow more fungus. And then we could eat even more delicious fungus. 
We've always done it this way, said the other ants. It's just how we've evolved. That's no reason, said Myrna. Evolution, schmevolution. I say we take more leaves. What do you think that will do to the tree? Asked Myrna's little sister, whose name was Mo. We don't want to hurt the tree. Hurt the tree, said Myrna. The tree is so big, and we're so small. The tree has always been here. It is impossible to hurt the tree. Let's get more leaves. So the ants harvested more leaves than usual that season, and the tree grumbled a little for its lost leaves, but the ants didn't hear it. They grew more fungus than the year before, and they ate until they were full and then some, and they were pretty happy about that. The next season, Myrna said, Last year was good, but we should take even more leaves and grow even more fungus. What would we possibly do with all that fungus? The other ants asked. That's more than we can eat. Right, said Myrna. We'll have leftover fungus, and we can trade that with the other ants in the forest for stuff. The ants were confused. What, what kind of stuff? I don't know. Bits of amber, teeny tiny rocks, torn pieces from a discarded candy wrapper, threads from an old shoelace, you know, consumer goods. But the tree, said Mo. what about the balance of nature? Balance schmalance, said the ants, we want shiny things. So the ants cut even more leaves off the tree and they grew even more fungus, so much they couldn't possibly eat it all. And they traded the fungus around the forest for all kinds of things found on the forest floor. Acorn shells, bits of feather, a mouse bone, a bottle cap. Myrna herself took to wearing a tiny piece of an old chewed up starburst on top of her head and she looked fabulous. But the tree did not look so fabulous, with so many of its leaves cut to ribbons, and it did not feel fabulous either. In fact, it felt very sick. And when a tree starts to feel sick like that, its leaves get sick too, and they stop being a good place to grow fungus, which is something the ants didn't know. Soon, New fungus stopped growing from the leaves the ants were spreading out because the leaves were sick, and the fungus that was already there began to die. What is happening to the fungus crop? cried the ants in alarm. They tried to spread out even more leaves, but that did no good at all because the leaves were sick. Soon, all the fungus crops were dead, and the ants knew that that meant no more fungus could grow because it takes fungus to make more fungus. With no fungus to grow, said the ants, we will surely starve. Myrna thought, what have I done? But Myrna's little sister, Mo, had an idea. She went from ant to ant and gathered up all the stuff they had traded for as much as she could. And she went to a neighboring colony in the forest and she traded all that shiny stuff, every last bit of it, for a little tiny, piece of fungus, just the tiniest piece. That was all the other ants could spare. Then she brought it back to her tree. Look, said Mo, and she held up the tiny piece of fungus. It's so small, the other ants said. It will be enough, said Mo. We'll have to start all over and, and grow a new fungus crop from almost nothing. And we'll have to go very slow at first to give the tree time to heal. It will be hard but we can do it. And when we do, said Myrna, this time we'll grow no more than we need and only take from the tree what it has to give. And so the ants returned to living in harmony with the balance of nature and the ants and the fungus and the tree lived happily ever after. The end. Inch by inch, row by row, I'm gonna make this garden grow. All you need is a rake and a hoe and a piece of fertile ground. Inch by inch.
I invite you into a time of centering, of meditation, reflection, whatever word works for you. I invite you to feel whatever it is that is supporting you, to feel your body being pulled by the gravity of this earth, our home. Take a few deep cleansing breaths. Allow your mind to focus in on that life-giving air as it enters your body. And then letting it go. And a few more. So we think about a balance of nature. We know that nothing exists if it wasn't for the humble bee. I invite you to enjoy this little video about a lovely little bee. Like trains of cars on tracks of plush, I hear the level bee a jar across the flowers goes, their velvet masonry. Withstands until the sweet assault their chivalry consumes, while he, victorious, tilts away to vanquish other blooms. His feet are shod with gauze, his helmet is of gold, his breast a single onyx with chrysoprase inlaid. His labor is a chant, his idleness a tune. Oh, for a bee's experience of clovers and of noon. The first time I saw an orca, a orca killer whale, was in the Vancouver Aquarium. I was just a kid and I was living in Melfort, Saskatchewan. We had come out to visit my dad's sister, Peg, in Richmond, BC, as was my aunt's custom. 
We were treated very well and saw all that Vancouver had to offer. I couldn't get over the amazing orca. Its tricks, its splashes, and how much fun it was to watch them and the other sea mammals in the aquarium. Those days are over here in Canada. We no longer believe it is acceptable to keep these sentient and magnificent beings in captivity. Vancouver Aquarium captured its first killer whale in 1964, and it was that whale named Skana, 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 I can't remember how, to, how it was pronounced, that, and that's who I enjoyed watching. I love the whales, the dolphins and the sea lions, and I watched them many times over the years visiting the aquari Vancouver Aquarium with friends and relatives. And then when I was a very young adult, I lived in Victoria for a short time and would often go to the aquarium at what I now know as the Oak Bay Marina. Back then, they had Tilikum in captivity, the whale that was the star of the documentary Blackfish and was responsible for three human deaths while he was in captivity. He got his start and was quickly, he got his start and began earning his dark reputation in Victoria and was quickly moved to SeaWorld in Orlando, Florida. He was from Iceland and he died on January 6, 2017. And I was seeing him in the late 1970s, around 1980. So he was um, 37 years old, and he lived all that time in captivity, at least 37 years old. I think he was quite young when Victoria got him. My fascination with these magnificent creatures continues, and I have been fortunate enough to see many of them in the wild. One of my favorite places to get my balance back is on the shores of the Pacific Ocean. I have spent many days on the shores of San Juan Island, just south of the Killer Whale Research Center, staying at my longtime friend's family property. It was here that, or there, that I began to learn about orcas and their importance to the First Nations people, to the sea, and to the balance of nature. Off the west coast of BC and Washington, live the resident, southern resident killer whales. They live in three matrilineal pods and they live and hunt together. And sometimes they join together in one big super pod, it's called. And they are very picky eaters. They will only eat salmon and not just any salmon, Chinook salmon. Now, I don't blame them, for Chinook is probably the best tasting salmon in the world, and the reason for that good taste is the high fat content. Orcas have a very high caloric need, and they have figured out that Chinooks are the way to go. Over the time staying with my friend and her family, I, I learned how to tell the whales apart what some of their names were, how old they were, how they were related, and so on. Now they are in danger, and the latest report that I have read is that they are mostly all emaciated, and one of the biggest concerns is the lack of females of mating age. There are many documentaries on the southern resident killer whales, and of interest, there are other resident pods around the globe. These pods, these resident pods, are, they differ from what are called transient orcas. Transients are the ones that will hunt and see, eat seals. Sometimes I've found myself shouting out to the sea as a pod swims by when I'm on San Juan, and I'm just like, just eat a seal for goodness sake, you're starving out there. I'd like to show you a couple of pictures of the property I'm talking about, and one of them is me watching for the whales.
So why am I telling you all this? When we think about a balance of nature, we can think, hey, there's a lot of fish in the sea, there's lots of trees on the planet and so on. And I'm hungry, just like the ants in our story. We can, we can just keep eating the fungus. We can just keep eating the fish. We don't have to worry about it. However, the whales on the west coast of Canada and the States tell us that we are out of balance. We are overfishing, not taking the whales' needs into account when quotas are decided. People might say, well, the folks who rely on fishing for an alevi need to eat too. And aren't humans more important than whales anyway? Again, I would beg you to look at the importance whales have on balancing the ecology in the ocean. Oceans, they're the ones that fertilize and stir things up. So they dive deep and they bring the water down and they bring it back up and they, and they fertilize the, the green that the other plants and the, the plants that the other fish rely upon. And they kind of like the, they're kind of like the giant wooden spoons in the sea. The biggest problem for these orcas is, is that the Snake River, a tributary of the Columbia River, has four dams on it. It is one of the major spawning rivers for, for Chinook and for Sturgeon. The dams create hydroelectric power with no emissions, and we dearly need electricity to power our electric bikes and our electric and our electric cars. Do we free the Snake River as many are calling for, or do we let the orcas starve to death? Herein lies the quandary that is in the balance of nature. If we do nothing, the orcas will starve to death. Many have, in fact, in the past few years. I invite you to learn about the southern resident killer whales. They are fascinating. They are beautiful. They have close relationships with their kin. Also, the Lummi people of the West Coast understand those whales to be their kin as well. I am obviously passionate about these whales, and I'll stop there. I'll stop talking about the whales, and I'd like to turn things back to you. Where do you find your passion, your joy, and your balance? Some folks find their balance on a shore, or others deep in the woods, or maybe on a mountaintop skiing, or perhaps scrambling a peak. Here's my wondering, why do we find peace in nature, or why not, for that matter? In the chat or on a piece of paper or just in your mind, I invite you to write down some of the scenes, the places, the, the views, the vistas that make you take a big inhale of breath. What is it about that place that you like? Maybe it's your garden and you love the messiness or the orderliness of it. Why do we as humans need to get into nature? Why do we need to feel connected to the earth? Or why not? I don't have any answers for you. I can only tell you why I need to get out into nature. I find I have to get out into wild places. It's where I can, it's there that my head can stop spinning. I look for wildflowers, or birds, or mushrooms and try to identify them. I can shut out the pressures of the day. I can ask my body to climb one more hill, or peek around one more turn before heading back to my car. There's a word in Japanese, it's called tree bathing. And I do indeed feel like I have been cleansed after I've been to the woods. My troubles seem less significant, my body stronger, and my resolve greater. Nature mirrors our longing 
for healing, for hope, and for resilience. We can see the season's damage, and we can see how things bounce back year after year. Now, if you stay after the chat, after the service to chat, do, do share your experiences in nature with one another if you like. Your hope and experience in healing and balance that only a good dose of getting out and beyond ourselves can bring. I've talked about how our short-sightedness has harmed creatures, has tipped the balance for only one species, just like our leaf-eating ants. There are millions of other examples, and there are millions of examples of plants and animals thriving and being protected. I encourage you to discover what creatures and plants are in danger here in Alberta and what is being done about it. We are part of this intricate web of life, as our seventh principle calls us, talks to us about, and, and we are responsible for ourselves and our decisions. What is one thing you can do to lessen your ecological footprint, your carbon footprint, as it were? Now, I'm not suggesting we need to stop eating salmon or stop using our cars. But there are things we can do, especially in light of our eighth principle. We can educate ourselves and support endeavors that are trying to bring back indigenous ways of being and knowing into land conservancy. And we can learn about reconciliation and reclamation projects. You can think of many more things than I can to help find your balance and the balance of nature. As you go through your summer, get out and enjoy all that is beautiful and wonderful, all that this wonderful world has to offer us. We are so lucky to be living in such an amazing part of the world. Blessed be, Ase, Ashe, and Amen. And now let's join with Lee Morris in her rendition of Our World is One World. She brings this hymn to life. Sing along or listen or hum, whatever you like. Our world is one. is one affects us so the seas that wash us round about the clouds that cover us the rain that falls our world is one the thoughts we think affect us so
thanks to Leah Morris for uh, providing all this fantastic music. Uh, she is she has a website. This is Leah.com. Uh, she is a Unitarian Universalist and uh, lives in Washington, D.C. and is part of the All Souls Church there. If you watched the G General Assembly service last week, you would have seen her um, as she took part in that service. And I encourage you to support her and, and her, her music. I would also like to thank everyone who is, has viewed this service or is going to view this service in the future. I hope that you've had some good conversations. You will have some good conversations and after the service or um, maybe this, some of the questions have made you think or made you wonder or I've piqued your interest in the southern resident killer whales. But as we go forth into the summer and we uh, are in our collaborative summer services, I would also like to thank everyone that has made these this collaboration possible, all the tech, techie people in each of the congregations and all of the people involved in putting these services on over the summer. I am very grateful and I know that we will benefit greatly from this delightful collaboration across the Canadian prairies. And now I extinguish our flame with words by Eric Williams, a four element blessing. May the firmness of the earth be yours. May the flow of the water be yours. May the freedom of the air be yours. May the fierceness of the fire be yours. And may all of the gifts of this life, the below and the above, be with you now and remain with you always. And I'll blow out our chalice. Our chalice is now extinguished. And I offer you these words of benediction by L. R. Nost. Do not be dismayed by the brokenness of the world. All things can break and all things can mend, but not with time as they say with intention. So go and love intentionally, love extravagantly, and love unconditionally. For the broken world waits in darkness for the light that is in you. Go in peace, gentle people. Go in peace. And now I invite you to enjoy the postlude, Without Rain, by David Rowe. Without rain, there are no flowers. Without sun, there is no rain. Without love, there is no beauty. Without life, there is no Thank you.
Take these flowers, behold their beauty. Smell the fragrance that they share. Such beauty lasts for just a short time. Enjoy the moments they are here. Now, if you cast your eyes skyward to that bright ethereal blue, and you see.